you know, there have been some great songwriters and producers, duos, when it comes to this R&B soul music genre, like, you know, Babyface and L.A. Reid, Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis, Gamble and Huff, and the list goes on. But then you also have some of the greatest male and female duo singers like Peaches and Herb, B.B. and C.C. Winans, Kendrick, The Family Soul, and many more too. But there was a duo that could write songs, produce songs, sing songs, and perform the songs. Plus, they were husband and wife, which is Ashford and Simpson, Nick and Val. They were multi-talented, and some say they were the best kept secret in the music industry. The special thing I love about them was that they was actually husband and wife. They was married. I don't think that has ever been done before. Their singing passion was very real. When they got on stage to perform it, it just felt real. You knew it was real love with them. When they were creating music, they said, just like every other couple, you know, they had their ups and downs. They argue, they fight, but they always made up before they left the room. They might argue backstage, but they said they never perform at a show mad at each other. Luther Vandross said that he used to always study their backgrounds and ad-libs. They were the best. 22 gold and platinum records, over 50 ASCAP awards, plus the Founders Award, which is ASCAP's highest honor, and the Pioneer Award from the Rhythm and Blues Foundation. They got more than four decades of doing music together, and everybody remembers the song, Solid as a Rock. Solid as a Rock. You know, Ashford and Simpson don't get the props that they deserve, but today, I'm going to give them their flowers and honor Nick Ashford for being the pioneer. So let's get into the story. Now, Nicholas Ashford was born on May 4th, 1941 in Fairfield, South Carolina, but raised in Willow Run, Michigan, which was about 60 miles from Detroit. Now, he was one of four kids, which was all boys from his parents, Alice and Calvin Ashford. His father, who was a, he was a construction worker at the time. But you know, growing up, Nick just wanted to be an entertainer, an actor, a singer, dancer, whatever you name it, as long as he could entertain. But, you know, he was raised in the church. He was a member at Willow Run Baptist Church. And that's where he started singing and writing songs for the gospel choir there. He said around the age of 13 years old was when he had a very inspirational feeling while in church that he kind of knew that he would be great at music and songwriting one day. So, you know, after graduating high school in 1959, he attended, he had attended the college at Eastern Michigan University. But after three years there, he dropped out and ended up leaving school to go to New York to be a dancer. He loved jazz dance. Now, once he got to New York, things got kind of rough for Nick when he left his hometown, Michigan. Because when he left Michigan, he only had $64 to his name. So, you know, when he got to New York, he found out that there's a lot of good dancers there too in New York. So things didn't turn out the way he wanted to. And things got kind of rough to the point he was he was on the streets, you know, trying to get money. He, he figured if he can get a quarter a day, 25 cents, he will be able to survive buying two hot dogs a day during that time. But things just got so bad to the point that he became homeless and had to sleep on the park benches. Until one day, he was so hungry that he asked somebody where he can get some food at, a free meal or something. And somebody told him that he can get a free meal at this church in Harlem. So <laughs> just to eat and go get a meal, he would go to this church called White Rock Baptist Church. You know, plus he loved going to church to hear the word and give him strength and motivation. But one Sunday morning in 1964, while attending that same church, 
he saw a young, beautiful 17-year-old girl playing the piano and singing with two other girls in the choir, which was Valerie Simpson. Now, see, Valerie Simpson was from the Bronx in New York, and, you know, she was piano trained. I mean, she took piano lessons later on, but she learned how to play by ear in church. She was actually five years old. She was just gifted like that. She was God gifted with that piano. And, you know, for her growing up, she was inspired by female artists like Nina Simone and Aretha Franklin because they could sing and play the piano, too. And a little fun fact about Valerie Simpson, right? Her brother named Ray Simpson replaced Victor Willis in the Village People as the lead singer. And her other brother named Jimmy Simpson produced the R&B group called GQ. You know, GQ did that song, I Do Love You, that was on Baby Boy. But anyway, so Nick and Val, they met that day in church. And Nick told Valerie that he write gospel songs in which the group she was in at the time called the followers needed a gospel songwriter anyway and they got together and they just formed a musical partnership next thing you know nick joined the church choir and the gospel group the followers and they started creating songs together nick was good at writing lyrics that was his thing writing lyrics and valerie We'll play the piano, come up with the chords and the melody. They kind of collaborate on the melodies together. And he was 21 years old at the time when he met Valerie, who was 17. <laughs> Valerie said she was attracted to him right away when she first saw him. But Nick said he wasn't focused on her like that at that time because she was too young and had just graduated high school. He was like a grown man. He was trying to get his, trying to get his life together at that time. So they continued to collaborate and create music together. And one day these two guys, right, came up to that White Rock Baptist Church looking for some young talented singers at the time to sing at their new gospel club called The Sweet Chariot. So, you know, they agreed to perform, sing and write some gospel songs for them. So after that, their gospel group called The Followers ended up getting signed to Roulette Records. And they released that album of gospel songs titled Meeting. Hmm. That's crazy because Roulette Records was a mafia label run by Morris Levy. Hmm. I guess Morris Levy was into gospel too. He didn't care. He was taking everybody publishing at that time anyway. So they got Roulette Records. And then they ended up meeting someone who asked them if they could write some love songs. They was hesitant at first to write love songs because you know Nick and Val came from the church they was church people but they said they prayed on it and decided to do it started writing some love songs and that's when Val and Nick ended up leaving the followers to do secular music and they ended up signing a deal with Henry Glover who used to be an executive at Roulette Records they sold their first batch of songs for $75 so you know then they formed a duo group called Valerie and Nick and put out some singles like I'll Find You, Lonely Town. It ain't like that and you don't owe me a thing. Now also around that time they ended up linking with singer Joshy Joe Armstead who was one of the original Ikeettes for Ike and Tina Turner but after she left Tina and Ike she started writing songs under the name as Dina Johnson so they wouldn't track her down. And when she hooked up with Nick and Valerie, they started focusing on writing songs together. And they started writing songs for artists that were signed to the label Skepta Wan Records. They wrote, for, they wrote the song for Ronnie Millsap called Never Had It So Good, Maxine Brown's One Step at a Time, The Real Thing for Betty Everett, who was on VJ Records at the time. And they wrote for a bunch of other artists like the Shirelles, the Guess Who, Chuck Jackson, many more. Now, one of the first biggest hits they wrote was the song called Let's Get Stoned by Ray Charles, which hit number one on the R&B charts in 1966. It's crazy because Ray Charles recorded that song right after returning from rehab from his, uh, his heroin addiction. They also wrote the song called I Don't Need a Doctor by Ray Charles 
and Aretha Franklin's Cry Like a Baby. But here's the crazy part, though. So around that time, Valerie started doing jingles and commercials. She was the voice of Budweiser Beer, Canada Dry Ginger Ale, and Almond Joy Candy Bar. That sometimes you feel like a nut, sometimes you don't. That's her. Wow, that's crazy. And look, she was making so much money, like close to six figures doing those jingles at that time. That's crazy. But, you know, Nick wanted her to get back to writing songs with him. And, you know, it got to the point that Nick told her she needed to make up her mind if she wanted to be his writing partner. Because he had left and did another song with a Motown producer named uh, Frank Wilson and everything. Now, the good thing was this. Because, see, once they did that big hit for Ray Charles, that Let's Get Stone song, that's when Nick and Valerie caught the attention of Motown Records producers Holland Dozier Holland, who told Barry Gordy to sign Nick and Val to the label because, you know, at the time, Barry Gordy was looking for some songwriters. He needed some songwriters for his duet duo he had just put together, which was Tammy Terrell and Marvin Gaye. So they get with Motown Records. They write, look, they was writing, Nick and Val was writing three songs in three hours. They were fast writers, but you had to be fast writers and good writers at Motown at that time. And the first song they gave Tammy Terrell and Marvin Gaye for their United album was called Ain't No Mountain High Enough, which hit number 19 on the Billboard pop charts and hit number three on the R&B charts. And the crazy part is, look, singer Dusty Springfield heard the song first before Motown Records, and she wanted to record the song, but Nick and Val told her no because they knew it would be bigger over there at Motown Records. The Supremes and The Temptations at that time had did a joint album too that same year. And um, they did a version of the song too. Plus Nick helped produce and arrange the song called I'm Gonna Make You Love Me, which hit number one on the charts for that album. But anyway, another song on that Tammy Terrell and Marvin Gaye United album they wrote was called Your Precious Love, man. Your Precious Love hit number five on the Billboard Pop Singles chart and number two on Billboard's R&B Singles. I still still play that song to this day, y'all. It's one of my favorite songs. Then, for Tammy Terrell and Marvin Gaye's second album called You're All I Need, they wrote the song called Ain't Nothing Like the Real Thing. Man, that was a great song, which hit number one on the R&B chart and number eight on the pop chart. The song You're All I Need to Get By hit number seven on Billboard Hot 100 and hit number one on Billboard's Hot R&B Soul Singles chart for five weeks. You know, when they had recorded that song in the studio, Tammy Terrell had just got back from having brain surgery to remove that tumor. Plus, that was the last song she performed before she died two years later in March 1970. You know, Valerie said she did a lot of singing in those sessions with Marvin Gaye because Tammy Terrell was going through her health issues. But Tammy did, Tammy did come in and put her vocals down when she could. Tammy just had to take her time laying down her vocals because of her health at that time. But you know, and me growing up in the 90s, I was a, when it comes to that song, You're All I Need, I'm a big fan of the Wu-Tang Clan Method Man's and Mary J. Blige version, which also went number one on the charts and won the Grammy for Best Rap Performance by a Duo or Group. I just love that song. But you know, Nick and Valerie also wrote the songs Keep On Loving Me, Honey, and You Ain't Living Till You're Loving on that Tammy and Marvin album, too. Then they wrote and produced Marvin and Tammy's third and final duet album called Easy, in which Marvin Gaye didn't. You know, people don't know, Marvin Gaye didn't want to record that album because Tammy Terrell was sick. She was too sick to record, but Barry Gordy convinced him that the money from the album would go, would go to Tammy's family, cover Tammy's medical bills, and help her family and everything. But, you know, like I said, Valerie did her parts on that song, on all those songs, until Tammy felt well enough to record them herself in the studio. 
that same year in 1969, Nick and Valerie, they won three BMI awards for the songs Ain't No Mountain High Enough, Ain't Nothing Like The Real Thing, and Your Precious Love. And here's a fact too. Valerie, Valerie Simpson became the first female producer at Motown. Wow, that's crazy. Now, after that, they went to work with Diana Ross, who had just left The Supremes and was working on her debut solo album, which was released on June 19th, 1970. And they, they wrote just about the whole album for Diana. But the song called Reach Out and Touch Somebody's Hand was the one, was one of the most popular ones, which hit number 20 on the Billboard Hot 100. And it also hit number 10 on the Cashbox Top 100 and number seven on the R&B chart selling over 500,000 copies. That's one of her signature songs still to this day. But Diana Ross also did a cover version of the song Ain't No Mountain High Enough, which would become her first solo number one hit on both pop and R&B singles charts. And it was also nominated for a Grammy Award for Best Female Pop Vocal Performance for her. I always loved Diana Ross's version of that song, Ain't No Mountain High Enough. I really think I like her version better, the way she come on in the beginning with the, just that. Man, that is crazy. They also now, they also did some writing on Diana Ross's second solo album titled Everything Is Everything and her third album called Surrender. Then they did some work with Quincy Jones for his 1970 album titled Gula Matari and his next album titled Smack Water Jack. But you know, they wrote a lot of stuff for the Motown artists, Gladys Knight and the Pips at the time, the Marvelettes, Martha Reeves and the Vandella, Smokey Robinson and many more. And that's when a lot of their fans who knew they wrote all those big hits for those other artists started asking them when they was going to put out an album themselves. You know, people wanted to hear them sing. And plus, they had a bunch of songs in the stash that nobody used. So that's when Nick and Val, they went to Barry Gordon and asked him, could he sign them as artists? And, you know, Barry, didn't, he didn't turn them down. He agreed to do that. And they started working on the album. Valerie had actually recorded two albums. One was called Exposed, and the other album was called Valerie Simpson. And she had a single out called Silly Wasn't I. But you know, when it came time, but here's the crazy part, he didn't really, but he didn't really support them like that. Because when it came time, they released the albums, Barry Gordy really didn't push or promote them like that. And he was still kind of looking at them as songwriters. He really didn't take them serious as artists like that. So, you know what? They decided to leave Motown after being there for seven years. Plus, you know, their contract was up with Motown anyway. So they ended up signing a record deal with Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers really was feeling them. They signed with Warner Brothers and they changed their name to Ashford and Simpson as a singing duo. And plus... They finally started their own publishing company called Nick Oval Music. Now, in 1973, they released their debut album as a duo titled Give Me Something Real. And the following year, in 1974, they released their second album titled I Want to Be Selfish, in which they felt the album was kind of rushed due to their label obligations. And, you know, plus, Valerie was pregnant at that time with their first child. So a lot was going on on that second album. And also during that time with that second album, they was offered to write the music for the Broadway play The Wiz at the time. But they turned it down. They turned it down because they didn't think that black people would want to see a black version of The Wizard of Oz. Wow. Also, that same year, 1974, the most important thing they did, <laughs> they got married. After nine years of just working together as a duo, 
and boyfriend and girlfriend. A lot of people don't know that for years, they treated each other like brother and sister. That's what the relationship was like before they became a couple. Nick had other girlfriends and Valerie had other guys in her life. But just one day, they just realized they loved each other and became a couple. But yeah, though, that year, 1974, they got married and they had their daughter, Nicole, right after that. In 1975, Valerie Simpson and singer Patty Austin, who were good friends, they sang background vocals on singer Paul Simon's number one hit song called 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover. That was a number one hit. And Ashford and Simpson, they continued to release albums like Come As You Are in 1976. They released two albums in 1977, which were So So Satisfied and Send It, which were certified gold. But then in 1978, they released the album titled Is It Still Good To You? which became their first album to hit number one on the R&B album charts and was certified gold. And the single called It Seems to Hang hit number two on the Hot Soul singles chart. But another song I remember hearing growing up, Is It Still Good To You? And the title of the album, that song, that was a big hit during that time. And uh, Teddy Pendergrass remade it and made it a hit too. That was the junk right there. Is it still good to you? Now, that same year, they went to work with Shaka Khan, who had just went solo after leaving her group, Rufus, in the band. And on October 12, 1978, she released her debut album title, Shaka. And, you know, Nick and Val wrote her first single, which was called I'm Every Woman, which hit number one on the Hot Soul Singles chart and number 30 on the disco chart. And you know, when it comes to that song, I'm Every Woman, we all know Whitney Houston remade it years later for the Bodyguard movie soundtrack and just took the world by storm. When she did it, it was number one on the charts all across the world. And that same year, 1978, they also was featured on the song called Stuff Like That with Quincy Jones and Shaka Khan which ended up going number one on the R&B singles chart. And they also did some writing for the Wiz movie for Quincy Jones too. Now, in 1979, they released the album titled Stay Free, which also went certified gold. And the single called Found a Cure hit number one on Billboard's Disco Top 100 chart. That song is interesting because you know, Nick and Valerie said they used to go to Club Studio 54. That club, everybody know that club, Studio 54, all the time for inspiration during that disco era. And, you know, in an interview, they said at that time, HIV and AIDS was big in that disco era. And a lot of people who had AIDS kind of took that Found a Cure song as their testimony of knowledge that love can make things better. Hmm. You know, plus that same year, they wrote and produced a whole album called The Boss for Diana Ross, and the song called The Boss, that hit number one on the Billboard Hot Dance Club play charts. I'm telling y'all, man, Ashton and Simpson was making number one hits like crazy. Now, here we go. 1980, they released the album titled A Musical Affair, and, you know, they was asked to perform at the Budweiser Summerfest with the OJs. Rick James was there, Teddy P, Smokey Robinson, Phyllis Hyman, the Bar Case, and GQ. The following year, in 1981, they released a live album called Performance. In 1982, they left Warner Brothers. They left the Warner Brothers label, and they signed with Capitol Records and released the album titled Street Opera, and also appeared on the television soap opera, Guiding Light. In 1983, they released the album titled High Rise, but 1984 was the year for them. 1984 is when they really took the world by storm, when they released the album titled Solid, which hit number one on the U.S. R&B albums chart, and it hit number 29 on the Billboard 200. 
and was certified gold. And, and let me tell you something. The single called Solid, Solid as a Rock, hit number one on a hot black singles chart, number one on the New Zealand charts, number 12 on the Billboard Hot 100, and number three in the UK singles chart. That was the jam. When that, when that come on in the beginning, we build it up, we build it up, we build it up, and now it's solid, solid as a rock, man. That's another song that always get played at cookouts and parties at your family house. That was the jam right there, man. And you know, it was also nominated for a Grammy Award in the best R&B performance by a duo or group with vocal category but they lost to the Commodores song called Night Shift. That Night Shift by the Commodores was big because Marvin Gaye had just passed too that year. Now, on July 13th, 1985, singer Teddy Pendergrass, who was 35 years old at that time, did his first live performance at the Live Aid concert in his hometown of Philadelphia since his car accident with Ashford and Simpson. Singing the song, Reach Out and Touch Somebody's Hand by Diana Ross, which was written by Nick and Val. And you know what's crazy? For them to bring out Teddy, man, it was beautiful. In his hometown of Philadelphia, in front of a live audience of 99,000 people, 1.5 billion TV viewers, wow, they brought him out. It, it was very emotional too, man. That video... Is on YouTube if y'all want to check that out. It's the Astrid and Simpson and Teddy P live 1985 live A performance. Now, after that, in 1986, they released their 12th album titled Real Love, which they ended up being nominated again for a Grammy Award in the best R&B performance by a duo or group with vocal category. But this time, they lost to Prince for his song Kiss. And, you know, that album, Stevie Wonder was also featured on that album playing a harmonica on a song called Nobody Walks in L.A. Now, that same year in 1986, they appeared as themselves in an episode on the television series The Equalizer. And they also appeared in the daytime soap opera One Life to Live. In 1987, they had their second daughter named Asia. In 1989, they released the album titled Love or Physical, but they also wrote a song called Uh Oh, Ooh, Ooh, Look Out, Here It Comes for Roberta Flack, which hit number one on the Dance Club play charts. I like that song too, Here It Comes by Roberta Flack. In 1991, Nick Astra landed a role in the movie New Jack City as Reverend Noakes. That was a classic. Reverend Oaks. In 1994, Vesta Williams and Aaron Hall, they sung and performed their hits live as a tribute to them. Vesta, man, wow. Vesta Williams' vocals were amazing that night singing um, Valerie Simpson's part. Rest in peace to uh, Vesta Williams. And that video is on YouTube. Y'all want to check that out too. Aaron Hall did a good job singing Nick parts too. And... 1995, like I had mentioned earlier, Met the Man and Mary J. Blige song, I'll Be There For You, You All I Need To Get By, won the Grammy Award for Best Rap Performance by a Duo or Group. And you know, Ashford and Simpson, you know, they love their version of the song, but they have one issue with rappers using their music. In an interview, they stated that they have, you know, they benefited financially from rappers sampling their old music. But what they don't like is the way they sometimes fail to give the original artist or creator any credit. They say they felt a little insulted when Method Man and Mary J. Blige did You All I Need and the New York Times said it was the biggest record of the summer. But never once mentioned Ashford and Simpson had written the original version. They said it did hurt them, but once they got to the bank and seen all that publishing money, <laughs> it all suddenly became okay. They got all the royalties from that song. Wow. Now, 
1996, they started their own label called Hop Sack and Silk Records and released their final album titled Been Found, which was like a, that album Been Found was like a musical slash poetry collaboration with Maya Angelou. Now, also that same year, 96, they opened and launched their own restaurant and live entertainment venue called The Sugar Bar in New York City. You know, they do open mics there on Thursday nights and everything. That restaurant was really Nick's dream. He had a vision for that restaurant. And also that same year, 96, they got the Founders Award from ASCAP, which is ASCAP's highest honor. They also became DJs for WRKS-FM, New York's classic soul station. In 1999, they received the Rhythm and Blues Foundation Pioneer Award. In 2002, Ashford and Simpson were inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. In 2009, at President Barack Obama's 2009 inauguration, Ashford and Simpson rewrote their song Solid as Solid as Barack. <laughs> Solid as Barack. They dedicated that song to him for that. You know, they released a uh, CD and DVD of their live performances titled The Real Thing. But you know, man, on August 22nd, 2011, Nick Ashford died from throat cancer just four days before Valerie Simpson's 65th birthday. You know, reports say he was undergoing treatment at a New York hospital. It's crazy because he was diagnosed in March after his voice, his voice just kept getting hoarse for some reason. And then so he went to the hospital and his last treatment was in June. He was diagnosed in March. His last treatment was in June and he died in August. Wow. Sad, man. Because, you know, he stopped smoking 30 years ago. Nick had stopped smoking 30 years ago. Plus, he was a vegetarian. He was in good health, good shape and everything. Wow. And, you know, after he passed, though, Valerie continued to keep their legacy going. In June 2012, she released a new solo album called Dinosaurs Are Coming Back Again. In 2019, they received the Grammy Trustees Award, which is a big award from the Grammys. The Grammys Trustees Award is an award to individuals who, during their careers in music, technology, and so on, have made significant contributions other than performance to the field of recording. Wow, that's a, that's a big award right there, y'all. Now, in 2021, Valerie Simpson was inducted into the Women's Songwriters Hall of Fame alongside Roberta Flack, Naomi Judd, Denise Williams, Don Lewis, Climax, and a few others. That's a big achievement too for her. But they don't have a star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame yet. Ashford and Simpson definitely need that star. They need a star on there, y'all. So we got to see what we can do about that. And Valerie, uh, she still performs, but she admits that she just missed Nick like crazy. You know, I understand. It's probably got to be rough. You know, she said uh, it's just difficult for her and difficult to perform, man. You know, certain songs like Silent, Is It Still Good To You? You know, she isn't sure when she's going to perform another full concert. And, you know, she just said it's rough. It's just tough having to sing those songs in the entirety alone. Wow, yeah, can you think of if you think about it, man? They they've been together since she was a teen, and they always been side by side by each other. And now, oh man, so we we just we praying for uh, Valerie Simpson, man. She's still doing her thing though. But Nick Nick was a pioneer, man. Him and Val together. I really do think they was the best kept secret in the music industry for our songwriters. Nick Ashford, man, 70 years old when he died. Rest in peace, Nick Ashford.